From the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, this is Human Centered. Today, host John Markoff has a virtual sit down with historian and CASBIS fellow Jefferson Cowie. Cowie holds the James G. Stallman Chair in the Department of History at Vanderbilt University, where his work focuses on how class inequality and labor shape American politics and culture. We'll hear their thoughts on the inescapable legacy of slavery, the political fracturing of labor, anti-statism, and whether the current structure of federalism can adequately address large-scale issues like climate change and pandemics. Thanks for doing this with us. This is our first COVID era podcast. So this is an experiment. Let's get right into it. I saw this, what I thought was interesting piece in the business section of the New York Times today, basically describing the meltdown of the gig economy. And it made me think about, so just sort of wondering if you thought about what the labor movement might look like after this. Right. Well, there's been so much chatter about what's going to happen with the labor movement in this moment. And a lot of optimism, I think, among labor people that this might be a turnaround moment. And while I think some of the objective conditions for workers might be there to make people begin to think about organizing, the structural questions about uh, federal policy and politics, I think, uh, and the other issues that are going to overshadow it, I think, make it a very, very difficult time for any any old school sort of labor union collective bargaining system really to get off the ground again in the near future. Do, do you see anything to be optimistic about in terms of grassroots mobilization or are there any optimistic straws in the wind? Yeah, I think that, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of actions that have been fairly uh, small, isolated on the ground, but they're getting some, they're getting some traction in, in, in small ways, but in terms of like large macro changes. I continue to be uh, a little, uh, you know, let's just say it, I'm pessimistic yeah. uh, about it. But I do think that that like there will be immediate changes at this plant or in this condition or, in, or the way these guys drive or, you know, whatever the case might be, um, especially with health and safety. But geez, that's all survival level stuff, you know? Yeah. And then um, what about specifically this notion that the gig economy has been just thrashed by this so far. I don't know what's going to happen over the next half year, but... Yeah. I mean, I, my rule of thumb on this is anybody who says they know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't know anything. We don't even know if the college is going to be open, let alone what happens to the gig economy. I mean, this is this is uncharted terrain, right? And mm -hmm. um, um, I don't see why the gig economy would not bounce back, though. In fact, it you could make the argument it would be among the first to bounce back because it's low, it's not capital intensive. People can get off the ground pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, something like Airbnb may not pop right back because people are going to be afraid of travel, but service level stuff, I think, could, could actually be among the first. And in California in particular, have you had ability to watch what's been going on in, in, at the state level and in the courts? A bunch of things have been happening to turn gig economy. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That stuff. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. I, I wonder if that's representative of something that's going to happen on a more national scale. Yeah. I mean, th there's like it's 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 interesting. You have to kind of step back and say what's driving what. Right. And and this. My, my friend and former fellow Lewis Hyman uh, talks about this a lot is, is kind of what is the gig economy driven by technology or is it being driven by the structural issues in the labor market? And I tend to think it's being driven by the structural problems in the labor market and the, and the technology is coming in to fill that in. You may disagree, John. Uh, no, um, not necessarily. And so to, for, you know, for those court decisions for, to, to sort of try and rationalize, create a, a, a sort of regulatory a structure, a regime to have those occupations, I think, more steady and reliable might be interesting, but it's also going to take the wind out of actually what has made the gig economy the gig economy in a lot of ways. Yeah. 
So I, I want to come back to the pa pandemic in American politics, but I also wanted to ask you what it's like to be a, a working historian in the midst of a pandemic. <laughs> uh, I mean, how has this affected your research at CASBIS? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much driving, just sucking the juice out of every last document I have to write and before I get into the archives again. Um, but fortunately, I'm able to do that. I've got a lot, of, a lot of notes and I came here ready to write. So for me, I'm actually, you know, Nobody disturbs me and I get to write my stuff. So it, it, it's working out okay. I think I'm one of the few people for which this is uh, this is going to be okay. I'm asking you to completely speculate, but let's just say uh, COVID went away and we were back to normal like we were. Do you, how much of this stuff would stick around or do you, how quickly do you think we'll return to traditional methods of interaction and stuff? That That's a great question. I mean, again, we're in, we're, we're in fairly... Um, unknown territory but if we look at the end of a lot of crises wars the spanish flu there tends to be actually a fairly jubilant time afterwards people kind of become grateful and open up to the world and realize their interconnectedness and things like that so i mean i could equally paint you an apocalyptic picture yeah. of you know burning tires in the streets but um I, I actually think that maybe there's a little bit of hope because we're also at the end of a large political cycle here, right? I mean, there's been kind of a a historical fix since the early 80s to 2016. And now things are wide open. We don't know where we're going. And the pandemic's part of that. But I, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit optimistic about what happens in the next five years. And I am not known for my optimism. <laughs> Your your point on on jubilation or the you know just the the joy of being back in human touch is a really interesting one to me because um, my sort of dark analysis of the internet is there's been much less you know forget COVID there was already much less face to face contact because of the emergence of social networks there was a I'm blanking on his name but there was a Stanford political scientist who did really interesting early research on the early internet comparing it to television. Um, basically, if you look at it like television, you know, that's, you know, you, you look at the screen and you don't interact with other people. And so more people were looking at screens and not interacting with people. We've already gone a long way down this so, sort of isolation path if you're just talking about what you're doing physically. Right. So, I mean, this is probably not who you were thinking about, but Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, he yeah. looks at a, a variety of variables and says the tele you know, suburbanization of the television went a long way to essentially creating isolated, autonomous people who don't join things yeah. anymore. And uh, yeah, I think that's going to be a, a, an enormous problem. And I'm hope, I mean, the worst case scenario is we substitute this kind of Zoom conversation for reality yeah. in my book. Like I'm, I'm a reality based guy, John. I, I, I uh, <laughs> <laughs> completely old school. I'm, I'm a, I am old school, flesh, blood, dirt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the Spanish flu and I'm wondering, do any of our current labor circumstances track with what happened then and how did labor emerge from that? And is there anything it can, it can learn from that today? That's interesting because, you know, we think we have it bad, but the Spanish flu happened alongside the great war, you know, the war to end all wars. It's, you know, this absolutely Armageddon level conflict. And so the, the flu is chump change in comparison. But uh, coming out of that, you had, an, you had one of the biggest strike waves in American and world history in 1919. Uh, and it was, it was very dramatic. And this was a push, not just for the old, organize the old skilled trades that had been organized, but basic industry, especially steel. And this is when you had the Seattle Soviet, when the Seattle workers took over um, Seattle and ran it as a uh, kind of a socialist city and, and, and the Boston police strike and all this stuff. And that was all crushed. That was all, it was yeah. viciously crushed. But by and large, the, the culture survives. Uh, I think there was still a lot of excitement in the 20s, uh, the roaring 20s uh, afterward that was, that was, uh, really gave a lot of energy to the culture, you know, it's the jazz age, that whole thing. However, and here's the lesson for our time, there was nothing redistributing all the wealth that was being created in the 1920s. Um, and you had this incredible escalation of inequality, which ends in 1929 with the stock market crash. And then of course, 
12 years of depression. Can I ask about your current project? I guess a book titled The Dark Note of Freedom? Yeah, uh, it's recently been updated to uh, The Dark Note of White Freedom. Oh, is that because uh, your focus has changed or or you just, you're, it's, no. it better describes what you're doing? Yeah, yeah. more clarity, right, yeah. Um, yeah, so the idea is um, this book is working on two levels. One level is it's a study of freedom and the problem with freedom, uh, you know, this American creed that we believe in and we have no idea what we're talking about when we invoke it. And I'm using the ideas of a historical sociologist named uh, Orlando Patterson at Harvard. And he goes back and looks at the entire history of freedom all the way back to uh, the ancients. He basically says freedom emerges from slave societies, that we only actually understand freedom through slavery you know, in a binary kind of way. And that one of the key elements of freedom, he breaks it down into several things, but one of the key elements, what I call the dark note, is the freedom to oppress, the freedom to own others, the freedom to drive others to do what you want. And of course, one of the great sort of mysteries of American history is how all this talk about freedom emerges in the United States in a slave republic. And so I'm getting at that. And the way I'm getting at this question is this sort of relationship between the freedom to oppress and the rhetoric of liberty as we normally think of it is uh, I'm looking at this little town in Alabama and four episodes of federal power coming into this town, federal intervention, Indian removal, reconstruction, the New Deal and civil rights and how this kind of racialized anti-statism among white people emerges where they establish their freedom as against the federal government because the federal government's coming in and telling them how n- not to treat minorities. So race, freedom, and federal authority all get mixed up in this mess. So, uh, you know, let me if I, see if I can tie together this essay that you're going to have in the New York Times, which is about drawn from this iconic photograph of the hard hat riot in in New York in 1970. And, you know, when I saw that picture and I was beginning to read your essay, um, I immediately thought of this other iconic photo that just emerged of these um, all white occupiers in the Capitol building in Michigan. And I was thinking about this in the context of your discussion of freedom, um, and, you know, freedom as it's framed in this new pandemic context. And I, I know you're doing history, but all of a sudden it sort of tracks, doesn't it? Yeah, no. Uh, in fact, Ibram Kendi, the African-American scholar, just had a piece, I think it was in The Atlantic, basically saying that you can understand the response to federal authority telling you what to do in the pandemic all the way back to this sort of anti-statism of slavery. Uh, that you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. And and uh, so, yeah, I, th- I think that kind of twisted idea of freedom that trumps other ideas of solid- solidarity, equality, what's good for the nation as a whole is alive and well in, in a lot of the responses to the. And, and would you call that ideologically libertarian is there, or is it something else? Great question. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, what I'm seeing unfolding in the South is essentially textbook libertarianism that I see today in a lot of ways. It's low taxes, low infrastructure, get the federal government and the state government off my back so I can do whatever I want. Unless I can use it to my advantage, then I will take, then I'll, then I'll leverage <laughs> government intervention in whenever I can. But also that where it gets traction, and this is the kind of interesting thing about American conservatism, where it gets traction is through race. So Goldwater can run on libertarian principles and stuff and win a few states. But what you really need is this sort of double helix of free markets and race in order to get people to vote for these kind of libertarian ideas, I think. They're not that popular on their own. So, you know, you mentioned federalism. And I wondered if you've noticed, um, you know, Gavin Newsom um, has uh, repeatedly recently been describing California as a nation state. And I, I haven't thought it's been accidental, but I don't know what his agenda is. And I wondered if you had a take on what's going on. Yeah, I just listened to another press conference he did. And he said, I'm just using this, you know, rhetorically. You know, he kind of backed <laughs> off that. But this is, yeah, this is in some ways the opposite of my argument. In Cal- there's a California exceptionalism because 
my argument is basically saying federal government comes in with a higher standard of whatever it is and says, you know, you are beholden to the standard and people fight back. Now we have California having a higher standard against, you know, a crumbling, you know, what's bordering to me on a banana Republic uh, and, and, uh, and having to fight back. I think it's very, very intriguing. I don't know what his actual agenda is. Um, but no, we've already tried, began to scratch our heads and wonder if, you know, hmm, which side of the line we're going to be on when uh, uh, <laughs> California breaks up. Could you conceive of, I mean, su- succession I seems so un- un- unreachable and yet it, it's, you know, why not? Yeah, I it, no, it's a great question because, you know, secession, I think, was the Confederate version of secession was literally a based on an entire discourse of freedom. It was all about freedom. We have the right to do this. And this is a constitutional right. And it kind of was. I mean, honestly, uh, you know, I think the North was morally right, but the South was constitutionally right. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's a horrible thing to say, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's true. And um, so, but California, I think, would be a, a fascinating thing. And, I, and you know, I, I began to think back on there's a there's this sort of theme in, in, in apocalyptic and futuristic stuff where the nation breaks into various regions like Ecotopia or something yeah. like that, where, you know, there's these sustainable, more sustainable level nation states. Cause I do think there's, there's actually a problem, a deep problem that's coming out about federalism right now, obviously. Right. We, it's not working. You can't with the two threats, COVID and global warming, you need centralized capacity to act. I don't think you can do this from the bottom up. And if the federal government's failing, I think that there is an argument to be made to try and do it, as well as the South's taking all the resources. You know, I mean, they're net takers yeah. in the tax game. It's kind of funny, uh, an ironic uh, 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 thing. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you pointed to in in your essay about uh, that photo in the Times, the Hard Hat Riots, was the, the the fragmentation of the working class as being this thing, and I and I wonder if you could sort of dial that forward. You always want to go forward. What about backward? You know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe give a listener a kind of s- synopsis of the Hard Hat Riots so that we can then project forward from that. Okay, so the Hard Hat Riot uh, happened uh, right after. Uh, Nixon made public his incursion into Cambodia in April 30th, 1970. Then the Kent State protests happened in, on the 4th of May, and the Kent the four kids were killed at Kent State. And then after that, there was uh, anti-war protests across the country. One of which was in downtown Manhattan. There were about a thousand people in the financial district demonstrating against the war. And then suddenly, in a surprise, uh, hundreds of, of construction workers who were working on the World Trade Center marched up, chanting all the way USA and carrying tools and, and, and pipes and all sorts of stuff, just burst through this demonstration, pummeled the protesters, and made their way to the top of the stairs of Federal Hall, which is where the protest was, and sort of raised the flag and sang God bless America. And, you know, it's sort of, I compare it with what raising the flag looked like at Iwo Jima, you know, it's this sort of scrum of humanity raising a flag. So this began to raise questions of a kind of fascist working class and uh, whether, you know, this new right wing white male working class was this, you know, Karl Marx turned upside down, that workers were no longer on the forefront of social change, but were in fact retrograde in the face of the the new social movements of the 1960s around gender, race, sexuality, uh, culture, the war. They they don't make explicit claims about race, but this does come on the heels of a series of um, anti-affirmative action um, demands by the unions because they wanted to maintain their... Uh, hiring privileges, aka whiteness, um, and so that that was certainly there. Uh, the EEOC was founded. In the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission was formed in '64, so it's beginning to the workplace is beginning to integrate. But the big push happens in the 1970s, so that's part of it as well. But it really seems to be about kind of this masculine patriarchal worldview that believes in flag, God, nation, 
Um, and, uh, you know, Pete Brennan, who's the head of the building trades at, at the time, he says, you know, we're the people who build the buildings. We don't burn the buildings. And that really kind of, I think, illuminated the, 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 the cultural divide at, at the moment. So this was more of a cultural difference rather. They, they didn't have any labor disputes that they were bringing to this protest at all. No, none whatsoever. Uh, there were no labor disputes involved. It was it was and, and it wasn't really organized. I mean, it had to be organized on a micro level. In fact, the labor situation was great. I mean, these guys were making time and a half building the World Trade Center. It was a good time to be a construction worker. But they really felt their world was slipping away with these coddled college kids who were just, uh, you know, yelling and screaming about what's wrong with America. And for them, there's nothing wrong with America. Uh, it looked like them and they wanted to keep it that way. But is the dynamic that led to Trump's election and the dynamic that led to Nixon's uh, landslide, are those different things or the same things? Very similar, I think. I think this is like there's several things, the Wallace campaign in 68 and 72, uh, the hard hat riots, uh, Nixon's what he called his new majority, which was uh, really an attempt to crack off enough of the white working class from the Roosevelt coalition and bring it over to the Republican Party. All those things were kind of that 68 to 72 period is, is this kind of uh, swirl of things that begin to coagulate into the new right. And that makes several things happen. Uh, the, uh, a chunk of the white working class moves to the Republican Party and the Republican Party becomes much more populist, right? It becomes Ronald Reagan at some point says we need to get out of the country club and get into the taverns get into the factories, make this a party for regular people. Yeah. And uh, I think he did, said that in the uh, 76 primary. And, um, and so he does, you know, and, and he builds us around America. It's, it's very much the themes that the hard hats were, were protesting around. And then, you know, Pat Buchanan, who was a Nixon advisor, he basically reads the whole thing and says, yeah, what we see is this part of, of, of the working class moving away from FDR, the, part, the guys who gave FDR those landslides in, in 32 and 36 uh, are now going to be for us. And then he goes on, of course, and has his own Soul of America speech in 92 and the culture war stuff. And then that, I think that wing that, you know, Gingrich, of course, uh, helps drive po polarization. And I think this this is all kind of one continuous thread that brings us to Trump. You know, since then, I mean, we've had globalization. We've had women entering the workforce. We've had probably a much more um, um, racially diverse workforce emerge. We've had the emergence of a much larger white collar workforce in America, probably, than we did. Manufacturing has largely declined to, what, 10 percent or whatever. So. There's structurally, there's things that are different than how, how do they play out? Right. Well, it's gotten worse for a lot of these guys, yeah. um, you know, especially probably not construction workers in New York. They're probably doing OK. But if you go into the old Rust Belt, of course, you know, you're getting what uh, um, Angus Deacon and why can't I can't remember their names. This is bad. Um, anyway, the two economists who um, who coined the term deaths of despair, where people are basically, you know, they are their world is no longer one of optimism and expansiveness and it's sort of odd that if you think about it african americans and latinos are more optimistic about the future than our white working class men wow. which is yeah which is kind of crazy but their narrative is sort of to them it feels like it's coming to a close there's few opportunities for them it's narrowing so i, I you know i what the hard hats felt in 1970 was essentially a slipping cultural place in the patriarchy. What you see now is essentially absolute, complete despair amongst a lot of those folks you know, and who feel like they don't have a place at all anymore in the political discourse. And I'm not saying that's accurate. I'm saying that's how they feel. The other meme that, that I run across all the time is that the increasing participation of ethnic groups in the, in the electoral process is going to move the... Uh, it's going to move the. You're sort of euphemistically talking about immigration. Yeah, sort of. Well, yeah, yeah, and and, and differential birth rates too. You know. Yeah. Right. Right. And youth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. No. I. I think there's a lot of potential energy there that is yet to be 
uh, realized. And that's why, again, I think this is part of, I think, the kind of uh, uh, churn we're in the midst of right now that I think uh, a whole lot of variables are, are spinning. And that's one of them. And I think, you know, if you go back before Trump, the Republican Party was suddenly, oh, we can't just be a party of white guys. We got to we got to diversify. We need to, you know, we're going to lose this. So let's get on the road to diversification and reach out to Latinas and stuff. Well, they're, they're still getting enough traction on whiteness and regionalism to survive. But I just, if you travel through the South or live there as we do, um, we're, we live in Nashville, um, you, you, you see the, the amount of immigration, especially in the cities. And, uh, and I, I think there's a lot of, another element of hope there for uh, getting out of this kind of dark. You know, there's been a, a lot of discussion about the potential connection between the Green New Deal and COVID. And more recently, I've seen people even suggesting an old New Deal and, and COVID. I mean, that's come up uh, in a number of different ways. And um, do those political, uh, you know, Crusades platforms of the last 30 decades have anything to to offer America in trying to recover from the pandemic? Wow. Um, boy, you asked. That question's a lot bigger for me than I think that it is for most people. I mean, most people would say, look at these policy initiatives. That's what we need. That would work. If, you know, whether it's an economy based on full employment or redistributive policies or unionization or improved social security, or, you know, whatever, these would all work. I, as an historian, go back with me now, uh, those thr thrilling days of yesteryear, um, the, the circumstances that gave rise to the New Deal were extraordinary. I mean, truly, not just in terms of the uh, economic crisis of the 1930s and then World War II, right? I mean, you essentially have 15 years of cataclysmic world consequence level issues but you also have things like there was no immigration really the democratic party was playing this game with black people where they're kind of in kind of out we're going to allow segregation but we're going to kind of court the black vote individualism was not as powerful as it as it had been prior or after herbert hoover gave the rugged individualism speech just before the whole world economy collapsed there's a whole host of things that were going on that were very, very different that, that allowed that to take off. So policy wise, yes, I think the Green New Deal or even the old New Deal uh, would would be great. The social circumstances that give rise to that, to keep, you know, the, the old adage in political science is the more diverse a society is, the harder it is to the, the less likely it is to be social democratic the more homogenous it is, the more likely it is to be social democratic. We're a very diverse society. So creating a, any kind of social democratic agenda is very, very difficult in a society where it's much easier to blame minorities or immigrants or whatever the case may be. For the period of the New Deal, that was very different. So as a metaphor for going forward, I think it's 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 kind of useful as a policy prescription, but it's less useful as in terms of the sort of social soil that gave rise to those uh, robust programs. Okay, so it, it seems like there's a fracturing of labor at that moment. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. John yeah. started to ask about that. Right. Yeah. And that crack kept widening and widening until the point where we had enough people sort of on one side of labor that they end up voting for someone like Donald Trump. And in this pandemic, it seems like people are, are expressing a desire to really inspect the world we've built for ourselves. And so if we imagine trying to repair that fracture within labor to sort of bring workers back together, does this pandemic afford us an opportunity to do that? Um, you know, I'm thinking we've we seem to be creating a new category within labor of essential worker. And I'm wondering if you see that as a, 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 a thing that can further that fracture or unite us, you know, new groups of workers together or, you know, how these kinds of labels affect labor politics. Well, the interesting thing about the term essential worker is it's, it already creates a divide, right? Right. Between essential and non-essential. Right. So, 
uh, the one thing that a revival of labor depends upon is some sort of vision of solidarity. And that, you know, the more we're talking about essential versus non-essential immigrant versus native, black versus white, California versus Tennessee, but, you know, the less capable will be of, uh, I think, of creating any sort of unified vision like that. But there are a lot of things going on. I mean, I think it's pretty clear at this moment that there's two issues, both of which push forward for questions of climate change um, that need to be dealt with. And one is, I think, federalism. I mean, going back to what we were talking about, that we need more centralized authority. That's what the New Deal was about. Um, it was about sort of taking that old anti-monopoly wing of the party and saying, nope, we're going to embrace bigness and we're going to regulate it. And I think, and then the other is healthcare. And if, without healthcare, uh, obviously everybody's vulnerable. Everybody. It's not just people without health care. It goes back to the old kind of public health thing that people, people more, even rich people in more equal societies will live longer. So, you know, and, and, and in, a, and in the midst of a pandemic, <laughs> all the more so. So anyway, I think there are some circumstances that are, that are, that are brewing in a positive, positive direction. I don't think it's like, you know, Joe Amazon worker walking out because it's, he's not getting the proper uh, uh, personal protection. That might be a small piece of it, but I think we need to look at some larger trend lines than just these sort of isolated incidents that we began talking about at the beginning of the. And is this why you invoke, uh, or you mention Richard Rorty? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> that kind of came out of left field. Yeah. Big Richard, <laughs> Rorty, big Richard Rorty fan. But that's essentially like, it wasn't the, the sort of achieving the country is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. So, you know, Rorty, if you go back, you know, in that book, he he predicted Trump with absolute clarity. He basically says, if we keep going with inequality like this and a bunch of snobby professors who are debating, you know, the nature of postmodernism and uh, a uh, Washington beltway culture that doesn't give a crap about anybody in the heartland, some strong man's going to rise up and reverse all the gains that have happened to for women and minorities and then he's going to rally white guys and it's going to get ugly and it's just like and that was in like 98 or whenever um rorty wrote that book so um yeah speaking of politics and academics sometimes it feels like we spend a lot of time talking politics but we may not all be great at doing it if that makes sense. Yeah. All right. And yeah, we, traditionally, we talk about politics like other people talk about football. Yeah. And traditionally, labor has been seen as this big doer of politics. It's, it's this huge kind of participant in the political process. But it kind of seems like that's been on the decline. And yeah, labor's in a tough position. So private sector union density is probably six and a half percent right now. <sighs> you know, it used to be 35 um, you yeah, add the public sector, you you know, jump up to 11 or something, maybe haven't looked at the statistics really. So, so, uh, numerically it's weak, still has some resources, still has some money, still is a major player in the democratic party, but much weaker. Unlike the hard hat era though, it is one of the most diverse institutions in American history. It's no longer just a, a white guy club that, so you've had this sort of dual change of a sort of declining power, but rising diversity. And um, that's been a major problem, of course, because there's, there's very little voice for the collective economic interests of working people being represented in Washington, right? Until things have changed. Things have changed since, you know, maybe since Bernie's run in 2012 and certainly since 2016, I think, as costs of economic inequality have become obvious. But... I don't think organized labor has a lot of leverage at the moment. And a lot of their members are fairly conservative. So there, you know, there's a backlash against paying dues to an organization that's advocating left-wing causes and things like this. Uh, but the energy that is happening, I think, on the, at the grassroots, look at Las Vegas, the culinary workers are, you know, essentially playing an incredibly dynamic, powerful role in Nevada politics. And so, uh, you know, it's one of the last great union bastions in America. 
whether that's the future or the past in terms of you know uh, what Vegas, what what the Las Vegas situation means for for the rest of the country is, is I, I I can't tell. But but I think you know organized labor is not in a strong position to advocate much, and it's historically played this role within the Democratic Party where it bankrolls everything and gets nothing. I mean, they've really been a source of a lot of money, and they have gotten very, very little out of the Democratic Party historically. Why is that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, there I think are the, other parties that uh, have anti-labor interests, right? They're, they're yeah. the party. I mean, so, certainly yeah. since the Clinton era, you know, when the Democrats went sort of more in a firmly neoliberal direction, yeah. uh, redistributive policies have not been at the top of the agenda. Even though they, you know, the era of big government's over, the North American Free Trade Agreement, all that kind of stuff that came out of the 90s made labor this appendage to the Democratic Party. And there's been all sorts of attempts to break away, uh, stop giving money to the Democrats, start putting money into organizing through new coalitions and new things. And nothing is really, they've been just been throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks and nothing is quite stuck. And meanwhile, the Democratic Party's emphasis since really the 70s has really been towards providing more equitable opportunity within the existing framework for women and minorities and other people. And, and that that's really super important, but it's not going to redistribute wealth on a macro scale. It's going to increase, you know, you, you can change the complexion of the pyramid, but you're not going to change the pyramid. If we were sitting in Nashville, where you're from, uh, if we were sitting there right now having this sort of conversation and we were surrounded by Rust Belt workers and people who've been hit particularly hard, not just by the sort of slow decline, but maybe the pandemic as well, what what would we hear? Uh, what will we notice? Well, two, I have two responses to that. One is we'd also be surrounded by black people, um, uh, which, uh, you know, so it wouldn't just be if we we're back in Nashville, it wouldn't just be, you know, Bubba Redneck, it would be uh, African Americans as well. And the interesting thing I think about the politics of white people in areas like this, and this I'm thinking a little bit here about my colleague, uh, Jonathan Metzl's new book, uh, Dying of Whiteness, where he looked at uh, people in, I think it was Tennessee and uh, Missouri and another state. And he it basically makes the argument that if you if you put all the pieces together, people who would profit immensely from having health care refuse to have any kind of public option, essentially because it would mean that black people would have it, too. Um, and I just I actually just wrote a chapter in my book about this where the 1901 Alabama Constitution that set up desegregation, it also disfranchised not just black people but poor whites as well. And poor whites voted for it to disfranchise hmm. black people, right? So I think there's this kind of uh, logic that goes all the way back to being a slave society that we have yet to actually deal with. Do we have historical examples where uh, people have tried to upend that logic? Sure, there's, con there's constant bursts of that type of, I mean, you know, reconstruction after the Civil War where federal troops went down and said, okay, everybody gets the right to vote. And we have the guns and the bayonets to make sure everybody has the right to vote. And it worked great for about 10 years. And then it didn't. Um, and I can explain why, but it didn't. Or the Populist Party, which tried to organize interracially in the 1880s and 1890s. So the CIO and the New Deal. The CIO is one of the uh, Congress of Industrial Organizations. The major industrial union push during the 1930s was the biggest gain in African-American history uh, prior to the civil rights era. You know, you actually had black steel workers making decent money. Uh, and, and, and then the, some of the interracial organizing that came out of the, out of the sixties, you know, uh, the freedom summer and things like that. So, you know, it happens. It's not just like total idiocy. When you mention reconstruction, it makes me think of, um, you know, for the past couple months, we've been seeing all of these COVID maps. And some people have been pointing out, hey, these lines look pretty much like the Civil War era maps. And 
I, I'm kind of wondering, is that just a coincidence? And if not, what does that say about our country? Well, the electoral, I mean, if you look at the electoral map, it's the civil war. I mean, prior to Trump winning some of the Rust Belt states, it's essentially the South. It's the old Confederacy. Uh, it's under a different party. You know, they spent the last four, 50 years switching parties because they were solidly democratic after the Civil War. And then after the Civil Rights Act in 64, they began to move to the uh, white people began to move the Republican Party. So, it, you know, this is all this deep, deep historical burden that we carry as Americans that we can't escape. It's not some weird genetic problem. It's it's that it's a product of history. And this is our burden to keep struggling with. And these huge problems that we're talking about, about federalism, our capacity to respond to COVID and global warming and unions, which never cracked the South, all this stuff is still connected to the fact that this was a slave society. Earlier, you talked about Richard Rorty briefly, who I think was a CASBIS fellow in sometime in the 80s. Uh, but I'm wondering, other than all of the archival research that you've done and that I'm sure you're buried in, have there been any books uh, that you've read recently that you'd recommend people check out to help them think about these topics? No, uh, you know, I, I, the, one of the problems with history is it's this kind of cumulative thing. It's, you know, you're building something out of all these bricks. And so it's not like, Wow, here's the here's the one that really tells it all. But so I have a problem digging out a single book. But I, I've been thinking lately about a lot of the questions that we've been thinking about. So this intersection between kind of inequality, fragmentation, and polarization, and the environment, and kind of federalism, and then like this this, this four way thing. So I, you know, somebody like Toma Piketty's Capital, I think is 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 important to at least understand you don't have to read the whole doorstop but i think it's really for inequality or um and i've really liked uh for fragmentation uh early hothschilds uh strangers in their own land um that really gets to some of the psychology we're talking about by you know she goes down to louisiana and actually kind of lives there and tries to make sense of this kind of uh world view that a lot of smug liberals uh uh don't really understand. So I find that pretty rich. Um, and I've lately been sort of diving into some of the stuff on, um, on federalism, like uh, Donald Kettle has got a new book, Divided America, about sort of an argument against federalism and that we need more, you know, in order to survive, we need more centralized power, you, can, you know, in terms of regulation or environmental policy. So those are some of the things and uh um a lot of those things are coming together i'm reading uh, walter johnson's book called uh, the broken heart of america it's on st louis i'm enjoying that one a lot too um has a great cover it's the un unfinished arc at st louis with a big hole in the center where the two pieces aren't, don't quite come together so it's very seductive uh, so there's a great. there's a smattering of answers to sort of uh, bring us home yeah yeah thank Thanks very much for spending time with us. Um, yeah. You know, having a historical lens is is really quite helpful. Uh, whether you think I live entirely in the future or not, <laughs> I do think that as a framing way of looking at the present, it's actually really helpful. So I appreciate well, it. Yeah, so, you know, sorry we can't know, go out and. Uh, I know beer would yeah. be great. Thanks, guys. All right, see everybody lovely. soon. Good job. All right, Take care. see you. Thanks, Mike. Bye bye. Yep. Take care, Jeff. Later, guys. That was Jefferson Cowie in lockdown conversation with John Markoff. To learn more about the topics in this episode, be sure to check out the show notes. Make a special trip to Jefferson's website to check out some of his previous books and essays. We look forward to getting our eyes on his forthcoming book, tentatively titled The Dark Note of White Freedom. Human Centered is a show from the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. To learn more about the people and projects at the center, visit our website by going to casbs.stanford.edu or follow us on Twitter, at Casbis Stanford. Special thanks to Casbis admin Paula Dios for opening the episode today. From everyone at Casbis, thanks for listening.